Today's lecture is going to be on the topic of cooperative breeding. Um, and this is actually a topic that I've done quite a bit of research on. Um, this, I've, the four species shown here, the brown-headed nuthatch, which you're familiar with, um, red-carcated woodpecker, which is also in our area, are two cooperative breeders. And then I actually started uh, my research uh, in this field looking at Aphylacoma jays, which include the scrub jays. And then for my PhD, I worked on the bee eaters, um, which uh, we've uh, I've mentioned in the past and we'll talk a little bit more about today. So what is cooperative breeding? Cooperative breeding is a system of breeding characterized by the normal presence of helpers at summer all nests. So this means you've got the normal breeding male, the breeding female, and then you have some extra individual or individuals that are hanging around the nest. They're called helpers because these are non-breeding individuals, typically, that um, perform per parent-like behavior toward the young that are therefore not their own offspring. So they're helping the breeders raise the breeders young. And so this is an interesting behavior to, to try to under explain why an individual should be doing this because throughout the semester we've tried to drive home the point that an organism's adaptations are driven by whatever would maximize their fitness. But uh, how can they get fitness uh, benefits from providing care to young that are not their own? That's the, the challenge to explain cooperative breeding. Let's first talk a little bit more about what some of the things that the helpers could do. What is it? What do I mean by parent-like care? Well, there are a variety of things that they could do. They could provide territorial defense, help help the male and female in that regard. They can take turns in incubation. Uh, most of the time when we talk about this, we're talking though about their contributions to feeding nestlings and feeding fledglings. Um, and also they oftentimes play a very important role in nest defense where they can significantly decrease uh, predation rates. And remember, um, we, we've kind of driven home the point in the past that the main reason nests fail is because of predation. So this can be a, a big benefit. Uh, in most cases, helpers are individuals that simply delay dispersal and they're still hanging out in their natal territory. So a natal territory is the territory in which they uh, were hatched and raised. So this behavior, this uh, appears to be what we call altruistic. So they're giving up their own fitness to help the fitness of other individuals, or at least they're giving up what we call their direct fitness. Are there, however, some kind of fitness gains um, that could explain how this helping behavior could be adaptive uh, to the helper individual themselves? One of the species that has been studied the best in regard to cooperative breeding is the Florida scrub jay. Um, in this case, a breeding pair can have, um, in some cases they don't have helpers, but when they do, they have between one and six helpers. Um, about half the territories do have helpers, and the helpers do bring food uh, to the nest, and that kind of distributes the workload. They don't actually bring more food uh, to the young, but they can kind of lighten the load off of the breeders. One of the key things that they do, however, is reduce nest predation. Um, territories that have helpers, uh, 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 nests that have helpers, tend to have much lower predation rates. The, now, so how long do these helpers serve in this helper role? Um, minimum of a year. All individuals go through this kind of like an internship for a year. Um, females typically then will d uh, disperse uh, at, at that time. Um, to attempt to breed on their own. Males may stay longer um, and sometimes helpers will stay uh, up to, to seven years, uh, including some basically never breed. They never to disperse uh, and breed. So do these helpers actually, th does the name apply? Do they really help? Um, here, here's data from Florida Scrub Jay showing that it nests that have helpers present versus those territories that don't have helpers at the nest, um, they do fledge more uh, young per nest. Same um, pattern has been shown in other species like gray crowned babblers where helpers um, do appear to significantly increase uh, fledgling success. So how do they do this? Okay, so one of the things again is increased or more consistent supply of food to the young. That has been demonstrated in uh, white 
uh, fronted bee eaters, uh, which are shown here on the left. Especially in years in which food is really hard to come by, the more helpers you have at the nest, the more regular su food supply and the greater amount of food that's brought to the young, and it significantly increases reproductive success um, of, of that nest. One of the species that I studied in Thailand uh, is this bird on the right, a little green bee eater, uh, Marantorientalis. And uh, one of the things that I found is, is collecting data on food being brought to the nest at, at nests that have helpers those versus not. Didn't see any difference there, relatively small sample size, but didn't see any significant difference there. But what I did show is that nests that had helpers had much lower predation rates. Um, there were snakes and lizards in the area that would get into the burrows. So these were, um, um, all crass forms are cavity nesters, and, and you can see the cavities in the left-hand picture for the white-fronted bee eater. They nest in these cliff sides. Um, little uh, green bee eaters, though, they just nest in the flat ground, um, just kind of like a burrowing owl would do. Uh, and they, But they do actually excavate their own uh, burrows uh, in these sandy soils. And so, but that's really prime uh, for being able to uh, have snakes and lizards uh, depredate those nests. So the more helpers they had, the, the more likely they were to avoid that predation. And I saw them many times chasing off snakes and lizards. Another thing that helpers may do is some studies have indicated that if you just look at a per nest reproductive success, there's not any difference between those that have helpers and, and not have helpers. Um, but there may be a more long-term benefit that helpers provide. They may allow the breeders to attempt more clutches per season. Um, so in the, in the case of the brown-headed nuthatch, we found that in the rare cases where there are four helpers at the nest, the female, once the young um, have hatched, she basically says, okay, y'all got this. Uh, I'm going to go uh, start getting resources to uh, build a, another nest and raise a second clutch. That's the only time they bring, they, they do attempt second clutches is when they have four helpers uh, at the nest. And then, um, so that, that's a, a way that they could increase the breeder's reproductive success um, for a year. Um, but they may also just increase the lifespan uh, and the lifetime reproductive success of the breeders. Um, and, and so there, there may be very little to demonstrate on a per year basis, but those with helpers, um, those breeders may live longer and so their lifetime reproductive success um, is, is accomplished by being able to just produce more nests over a longer uh, lifespan. So how does this all help the helpers? Uh, you may be wondering. Um, well, one of the things I've, I didn't mention is most of the time the helpers are the direct offspring of the individuals they're helping. So they're helping mom and dad typically raise their brothers and sisters. And we'll talk about how indirectly that will benefit the helpers because remember the evolutionary goal of all organisms is to pass on as many copies of your genes as possible. You can do that directly by uh, producing offspring. But if you don't produce offspring, but you can significantly increase the reproductive success of close relatives like mom and dad, then that benefits you too indirectly because they have the same genes that you do. Okay, so keep that in mind. We'll talk a little bit more about kin selection uh, coming up, but that's, that's how they can benefit through what's called kin selection. So, when you talk about helpers staying and helping at a nest, why do so? Well, you can look at this in a couple of different ways. There may be some extrinsic constraints, things that they can't control that basically del that, that f mean they have few options. Um, for example, there are perhaps no vacant territories. So that if they did disperse, where would they go? Uh, there aren't any territories to um, uh, attempt a breeding uh, 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 to attempt breeding, so just stay at home. Okay, so delay dispersal, um, and at the same while you're there, you might as well help mom and dad raise young. And we'll, again, we'll talk about why there could be some direct and indirect benefits uh, to that behavior. This is definitely the case in the Florida 
Scrub jay, the Florida scrub jay, lives in this very rare habitat, this Florida scrub that has to be burned on a very regular basis. If it gets too thick, they'll abandon this territory, and there just are no vacant territories. And more importantly, there really aren't any, even any vacant areas in which individuals, non-breeders, could float. So they really are stuck staying at home and serving as helpers. Another extrinsic constraint or, or something that would prevent individuals from being able to breed successfully uh, early in life is maybe a sex ratio bias. So in the brown-headed nuthatch, there is an excess of males in the population. So they may be able to disperse and find a territory and a cavity, create a cavity. Um, but if they can't recruit a female, well, then they're not going to have a rep reproductive success. And there might be um, reasons to therefore stay at home uh, and help mom and dad in a, in a cooperative uh, setting. Another extrinsic constraint is uh, a lack of basic skills to, to successfully raise young. This is called the skills hypothesis, and the idea is that if you do stay at home because you just don't have these skills, which you can't control, uh, at least initially, you can build on those skills. Stay at home, delay dispersal, and help mom and dad raise young. That increases their reproductive success, which again will indirectly help you but a direct benefit you're getting is gaining the skills so that maybe next year you can disperse and more successfully raise young in a less stressful environment so you're less likely to die after uh, trying to reproduce. So that's data to support this comes from Siberian Jays. Uh, if you look uh, on the uh, figure on the left, um, if you look at the number of years breeding and the number of birds uh, in each category, you see that um, those that delay dispersal tend to uh, live longer and spend more years breeding. If you disperse um, before you're one year old, um, boy, that may be it. You know, the biggest column uh, for, for those individuals is right here. They just get that one year of attempted breeding and, and it turns out not to be a good option. If you come over here and you look at the number of offspring that they produce, um, and, and the number of males that do that, most of them are just not successful at all. And those are the individuals that are trying to breed too early. Um, if you kind of wait a year, gain that experience, then you're more likely to raise um, uh, a number of offspring over a greater number of years. So delayed dispersal, in this case, because of a lack of skills, at least initially it's, it's an extrinsic constraint, something you can't control. But by delaying dispersal and helping for a year, you build up those skills so that you're more successful in the future. All right, so we talked about some extrinsic benefits that may prevent you from breeding and, and may um, influence a, a bird's decision to delay dispersal and stay home in their natal territory and help. Um, but again, why not just delay dispersal in those situations? What, what actually are there benefits to staying at home? Well, one is if you stay in a group, um, there may be increased survival just because of some of the benefits we've already discussed throughout the year about uh, living in a group and avoiding predation um, in, in finding food. Um, uh, it, it, it may be beneficial just to help you live, have a greater chance of living into the next year when you can actually breed. Um, Perhaps by staying at home and helping, you're also able to uh, be in line to perhaps inherit that good quality territory. This is usually only a, an option for the oldest male helper. Um, other helpers may, however, be able to kind of keep their eye on neighboring territories that may be of good quality. And as soon as a vacancy opens up, they may be able to take over uh, those territories. So uh, some of the, this is supported by research on this species here. This is the uh, acorn woodpecker, and this is a granary tree. Um, they they um, peck holes, individual little holes in uh, trees, snags usually, dead trees, and then they'll place an individual acorn in each of these holes. So this is called a granary tree, and it, it really defines the quality of the territory the number and the size of these granary trees provides 
a steady source of food. So this could increase your survival. And it also determines the quality of the territory so that you are kind of paying attention to which territories you would want to try to um, uh, take over uh, if the opportunity uh, presents itself. But let's get more fundamental. Why not, if there are some extrinsic benefits that keep you from dispersal and breeding successfully, why don't you just hang out and eat the food in the territory and just kind of be lazy? Um, what, what are, are there any other intrinsic benefits from staying at home, but more importantly, staying at home and helping? Well, the skills hypothesis kind of fits in this as well. We've talked about that from an extrinsic benefit, but also it, 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 it fits in this category as an intrinsic benefit by gaining skills. But is there something more gen directly genetic that you can gain by helping? And this is uh, where we, where I'm gonna, I've, I've already mentioned uh, kin selection. So by helping close relatives significantly increase their reproductive success, you can increase the production of what are called non-descendant kin. Descendant kin would be like your offspring or grand offspring. Those are your direct uh, genes that you're producing into subsequent generations. Non-descendant kin are closely related individuals that uh, like brothers and sisters, uh, uh, nieces and nephews, cousins to a, a lesser degree. If you can significantly, if you're closely related to the breeders in this situation, and you can significantly increase the fitness of these individuals, then um, you are indirectly increasing your fitness. And so we call this indirect fitness benefits uh, driven by kin selection. So I've got a simple mathematical example here. Let's say on average, um, a pair can produce two fledglings in the population. And maybe if you disperse and were able to success, successfully get a territory and, and recruit a mate, you could raise two fledglings as well. But that's usually kind of the best case scenario. If you're fairly young and inexperienced, you, even if you could get a territory, you're probably not going to have very much reproductive success. Maybe raise one, but you're probably just going to be a complete failure. Okay, so um, that's your challenge as far as getting direct fitness when you're young. If, however, you stay at home and serve as a helper and you help very close related individuals uh, as close as, and under typical situations, you're helping mom and dad. So you're helping them raise your future brothers and sisters. And if mom and dad could have done two, if this is what mom and dad could have done, great. But if you can say double that, then these individuals right here, you can't count to your fitness because mom and dad could have done them anyway. But these two individuals here, they could not have done that without your help. And these are equivalent to your own offspring if you're helping mom and dad. Because if you think about it, you're related to yourself 100%, right? Okay, great. But when you reproduce sexually, you're passing on 50% of your genes. Okay. So these two fledglings that you could have done up here by yourself, maybe, that's one fitness unit. That's a one. <laughs> um, each of these is 50%, right? So by helping mom and dad raise two extra young, this is equivalent. So these are your potential direct fitness gains under the best case scenario. But if you can double reproductive success of mom and dad, you can't count these because they could have done them on their own. But this increased reproductive success you're able to do, that benefits them directly. But indirectly, these are your genes too because you're related to your brother and sister. Your full brother and sister, you're also related to them by 50%. So this is an indirect way that you can gain fitness by significantly increasing the fitness of these closely related individuals. So um, the white-fronted bee eaters that I've talked about previously do show a combination of extrinsic constraints and benefits of Philip Patry. So in, as far as the extrinsic constraints go, um, in, in some years it's a really harsh environment in East Africa where these breed. 
and it limits the abilities of young birds to really successfully breed on their own. Food, food is just too uh, hard to come by and they have a hard enough time just feeding themselves. They're really not going to be able to, to feed young successfully. And so they're better off serving as helpers um, because of this extrinsic constraint, uh, limited food availability, and they lack appropriate skills. So this fits the skills hypothesis and it increases their future uh, uh, parental abilities. And we can see that there's a strong correlation here between uh, a rainfall amount and the, the percentage of, of individuals or the likelihood that individuals are gonna be helpers in this population. Now you may be looking at here going, wait a minute, that's a positive relationship. The textbook I used to use for this class sometimes does this, I don't know why, but if you notice, oops, if you notice here, the, the um, x-axis here is reversed. So instead of this being the origin with zero starting here, the, the origin is over here. So this is actually low rainfall. And in low rainfall years, those are the harsh years when there's not a lot of insect food available. Those are years you get a lot of, of, of uh, helpers. In high rainfall years, food's abundant. Anybody can breed. You tend to have much lower um, um, helpers in those circumstances. Okay, so that's talking about some extrinsic constraints that could induce individuals to not breed. But there are also clearly in this species uh, benefits to uh, helping closely related individuals. Remember, this is a colonially nesting species. And so in a, in a colony like this, there usually are going to be some individuals in the colony that you're closely related to. And sure enough, you see the probability of helping um, is influenced by how closely related you are. So if, if you're related to individuals by 50%, you're so much more likely to be helping them than maybe a nest associated with mom and um, uh, or dad and a stepmom that you're not related to. So that would that would lower that overall relatedness of the young to be uh, half siblings. And then you get less and less uh, relatedness of individuals. There still might be some reasons to help them, and um, that that gets a little more complicated but but much less likely because you're not going to get the fitness gains so that's that's the other part of this this is the fitness gains in offspring equivalents so the the genes that you're passing on indirectly by significantly increasing the reproductive success of close individuals you're getting far more of these fitness gains when you're helping individuals that are uh, full siblings or half siblings so this clearly fits the, uh, some of the benefits of philopatry. Benefits of philopatry simply means they're benefits of staying at home. Philopatry means um, um, love of country or love of place. And so by staying in your natal area you're in staying at home, helping to raise future brothers and sisters or, or stepbrothers, half, half brothers and half sisters, um, you can indirectly increase your fitness. Are there circumstances, however, in which there are non-related helpers? Sure enough, this does happen. So um, in the case of this bird right here, this is a pied flycatcher. In some years, they have helpers that are called primary helpers, and these are their past sons or daughters, usually sons. And they, just like the typical helpers I've been talking about, they help bring extra fish to the nest and feed the young, and everything's good. Um, they can increase, they can gain in, in indirect fitness by doing so because they're helping mom and dad raise their brothers and sisters. But in some really bad years, when food is hard to get, and actually in this case it's wet years, you know, because think about that, for a, a, a kingfisher, if the bodies of water are really full, the density of fish is much reduced. It's harder to actually find those fish. So in those wet years, bad years, the breeders will allow a secondary helper to bring food because they just need an, an extra uh, set of, 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 of wings and bill to uh, bring more food to the nest. Um, but this is an unrelated individual, so the question is why would they do that? Well, it tends to be a young male that's trying to get in good with a female and trying to sneak copulations to get some paternity associated with that nest or 
to at least increase the chance that they will breed uh, in the future with that female. Well, the breeding male is kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place here. He needs this individual's help, so he's trying to recruit him to the nest, but he doesn't want to lose paternity. And so what they show is that they're, they're, they are rewarding them by letting them potentially develop this relationship with the female, giving them that, that, that um, bait to, to do that. But they also beat up on them just enough to cause them stress that inhibits their reproductive capacity. And uh, Yuri Rayer, who uh, discovered this, uh, called it psychological castration. Remember we talked about uh, corticosterone, this stress hormone, cortisol, that um, can increase in stressful situations. These secondary helpers have really high um, stress hormones and that induces much lower sperm production. It, 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 as that goes up, testosterone goes down. And so this is a way that the breeding male can recruit these secondary helpers at minimum cost to losing paternity. So helpers usually are basically making the best out of a bad job. So they're helping um, because they either have extrinsic constraints or a combination of extrinsic constraints and uh, building up skills or maybe getting some fitness benefits through, through kin selection. But uh, usually they're better off uh, eventually if they can breed on their own. So what are the routes to eventually going from a helper to a breeder? Well, one, I've already mentioned it, it related to a potential reason to delay dispersal is inheritance of the territory. Again, usually this is restricted to males, and usually the oldest male is the one more likely to inherit that territory. This is the pattern seen in Florida scrub jays. Another thing, that, though, that you can do is um, grow your territory by increasing the size of your group. So you're basically raising a gang. Um, by serving as a helper, increasing mom and dad's reproductive success, you're growing more brothers and sisters, and you can work together to battle neighbors. Larger groups can outcompete their neighbors, grow their territory, such that so you may have two territories here together. One through helping gets a bigger territory. They take over this territory and make like this big super territory. But then one of the male helpers says, okay, mom and dad, I got it from here. They start, they go from cooperating with mom and dad to make this big territory to trying to occupy their own territory and defending this new territory against their close relatives. So you end up getting the same thing, but now you have two related groups side by side. And so that's another route um, to gaining a breeding territory, and we call this budding. Kind of like related to, to budding or kind of similar to budding is the formulation of, of coalitions by helping your mom and dad raise future brothers and sisters to make a gang. But instead of just getting the neighboring territory budding off, you can fly around looking for weak spots uh, in areas where you might be able to fight off the territorial owners and take over that territory uh, on your own. Um, so the individuals that do this, the dominant individual will become the new breeder and the subordinates that help to do this sometimes will go back and serve as helpers at mom and dad's nest, uh, but sometimes they'll help their maybe perhaps older brothers and sisters uh, as helpers and serve as uh, um, subordinates and maybe even inherit that territory if their older brother dies. Um, or in some cases, they may form social bonds with the opposite sex uh, breeders in the group, and there may be sh some shared um, paternity and maternity uh, associated with those nests. But let's ask a more fundamental question. So we talked about how helping can be adaptive in certain scenarios by helping to raise extra young, by developing skills so that it increases your fitness either directly or indirectly. There's still the potential in some cases, though, where cooperative breeding has been studied, that there doesn't appear to be any fitness advantages to this. Is, is helping always adaptive? And um, one of the things that I've studied is the, and, and 
argued is that there's the potential in some cases that helping is what we call the unselected consequence of, of selection for just regular parental behavior. Um, birds, as we talked about in, co-op, in, in um, parental care, are just really robotic. When they hear baby birds uh, uh, calling, it stimulates them to go get food and, and, and stick food down those gullets. Uh, and the, the, so the, the sound of begging, but also the coloration of the bills can influence, or the gape can influence feeding behavior. So perhaps these individuals that are delaying dispersal for extrinsic reasons, they don't have a territory, their sex ratio imbalance, there's just not a breeder out there, they're just staying at home. And they, in that context, they just hear baby birds breed, uh, begging and they start feeding them. Okay. So uh, in a situation like that, that may be how helping behavior could get started, at least initially is this unselected consequence of just how parent, extreme parental behavior has been selected in birds. And here's a far side comic that, that kind of talks about the potential of this, um, that birds just really do shove food down any hole that they can find. And this may sound a little silly, but remember, we've already talked about brood parasitism and how birds like uh, greater reed warblers are really picky at looking at eggs and making sure that, that they haven't been parasitized. And the cowbirds have to, I mean, sorry, the, the cuckoos have to work really hard in uh, evolving mimic eggs that, that can trick the host. But once they hatch, it's like they can't control themselves. They hear these uh, baby birds uh, uh, calling and despite the fact that they clearly don't look anything like themselves um, or like their own nestlings would look, they continue to feed them. So there is some indication that there is some really robotic, uh, there's been strong selection to just be a good parent uh, under, under normal circumstances, just do that, and how this behavior can be taking advantage of in situations like brood parasitism. But it even gets more bizarre in some cases. There are lots of cases in the literature of interspecific feeding um, by birds, for example, feeding at the nest of other birds if they lose their nest um, at a time frame when their, their breeding hormones or the prolactin levels are really uh, high so that they uh, have a high feeding rate. If they lose their nest and there happens to be another nest in the same tree or a nearby bush of a different species, they hear those begging young and they start taking food to it. Um, so there was a paper a few years ago that documented this in, uh, I think, 46 species. Uh, and that was a long time ago. So it's probably been discovered in more now. Um, but even more bizarre, I know of several cases that I've seen on the Internet of people reporting, saying, hey, look at what I just saw happening in, in my garden, um, of cardinals feeding uh, koi um, or these uh, large goldfish in ponds. So they come up to the water gulping air um, or going after um, um, maybe some food that's at the surface with those open mouths and cardinals will end up uh, responding to this, going getting food and bringing food uh, to these fish. Again, there's no adaptive reason to explain that at all. There's no way you can explain how that's adaptive. Um, but it's just this this unintended consequence for selecting for that very robotic, be a good parent under any circumstance. And perhaps again, by delaying dispersal for extrinsic reasons, that's just how helping uh, behavior uh, starts. So um, talking about looking at how cooperative breeding can start, that's one of the things that I've done a lot of research on is trying to look at uh, cross species comparisons and look at the factors that may lead to the evolution of cooperative breeding. So you do this by looking at a number of species and determining if they're cooperative or not, um, and then mapping that onto a phylogeny, showing how the different species relate to each other, and the likely pattern of evolution of the behavior. So in this kind of made up example, we've had a cooperative breeding evolve here, here, and at the base of this clade. So you could ask, is there something in common between the ecology of this species, this species, and this clade that led to uh, the likelihood of cooperative breeding evolving in those species? So um, I, I worked with Town Peterson 
um, on uh, trying to use a historical phylogenetic uh, studies to investigate the evolution of cooperative breeding in the Aphylacoma jays. So at the time, the Florida scrub jay was known to be cooperative and they have really good data to indicate why they're cooperative, why it's adaptive for this species to be cooperative and it uh, has a lot to do with these extrinsic constraints. There's just not uh, open territories available um, and they do uh, provide food to the young and great protection um, uh, against uh, snakes particularly until they reduce predation. Well, Town, uh, in a, a project that he was working on for his PhD, noticed that the, the scrub jays that lived in southern Mexico also lived in groups. And so he suspected that they were cooperative breeding, and so we got together some small grant funds and went down to Mexico uh, and documented that this population of scrub jays were also cooperatively breeding. But they live in a very different habitat. Um, these this high montane habitat, um, mixed oak woodland, and we couldn't find any evidence that there was habitat saturation like what was going on in Florida. So we mapped on the degrees of cooperative breeding in different Aphylacoma lineages. And one of the other species, two, two of the other species that are in the genus are the gray-breasted or Mexican jays and the unicolor jays. And it turns out that the uh, Mexican jays, the gray-breasted jays, um, in different populations show what's called plural cooperative breeding. Plural cooperative breeding is, is where um, there's even more sociality associated with this. It's almost like colonial, coloniality, but there's a territory and two to three nests associated with that territory and helpers may help at all of these nests or at least multiple nests. So it's kind of like a, an, another level of complexity of cooperative breeding. Singular cooperative breeding is more like what I'm discussing where there's one nest in a territory uh, and you have helpers associated with that. So that's what's going on in Florida and Southern Mexico. Turns out the unicolor jays are also doing that. This is the phylogeny that Town came up with during his, his PhD work. And given this, what we see is a clear pattern that the ancestral state for the genus Aphylacoma was this really highly social plural cooperative breeding and that it has been lost two times. Two lineages, the unicolor jays and the um, uh, basal group of scrub jays. Um, the Florida scrub jay and its closest relative, the southern Mexican uh, jays like the Oaxacan jays. The remaining western scrub jays are non-cooperative. And so we see this clear pattern and it, it kind of informs us to say that we've been kind of looking at this in the wrong way in the past. We were always describing, researchers were describing why cooperative breeding evolved in the Florida scrub jay but it didn't. See, it actually evolved to be less cooperative in this lineage because they inherited it from this common ancestor. So really the question might be, why do we see reduction of cooperation here? Why do we show a complete loss of it here? And perhaps why is it maintained in this lineage here? Maybe for very different reasons that from uh, why it was in a close relative. So let me kind of break that down a little bit more. Here's just a made up phylogeny. Perhaps the conditions that originally led to the evolution of cooperative breeding, maybe this black box indicates some kind of um, habitat. Um, in some descendants, they may still occupy that uh, same habitat. And so we still see the main um, adaptive reason for the evolution of cooperative breeding occurring here. In other descendants though, they may live in completely different territories now and may, you may demonstrate that cooperative breeding is still adaptive. Helping behavior is still adaptive in these situations, but maybe for very different reasons. So it's clear that cooperative breeding, for example, is still adaptive in Florida, but that's very different from the gray-breasted jays living in different parts of Mexico and Central America. Um, that in which that behavior originally evolved. So that that's important to realize that it's being this behavior is being maintained in Florida 
for likely very different reasons. Now, these green boxes here are indicating something even more different. So here we may see that, yeah, we have cooperative breeding going on here in this, whatever this habitat is in the green, but another close related species that lives in the same habitat isn't cooperative breeding. And you may study this species over here that has the helpers, and you, you may find that there's absolutely no reason for them to do this. It doesn't seem like it's adaptive anymore. Perhaps this is basically a vestigial behavior, what we call the ghost of selection past. Cooperative breeding was adaptive in, in uh, the ancestor of this lineages. They still have the genes to do delayed dispersal and provide helping behavior, but it's no longer adaptive, and perhaps someday they will drop out of it when they get genetic variability to um, um, get rid of that behavior. So it's just it's something we pointed out as a possibility. Um, I've also looked at uh, other groups of birds and trying to understand the ecological and social aspects of what may be related to the evolution of cooperative breeding. Uh, that's what I did for my PhD, studying um, the family Meropidae. Uh, these are crassiform birds called the bee eaters. And I picked this group um, not just because they're pretty, but they are really pretty, um, but because of the diversity of their behaviors with regard to cooperative breeding. So um, there were 14 species known to be cooperative, five species known to be non-cooperative, one species that has geographic variation. Some populations are, some populations aren't, and then importantly, six species that we just, we don't know or didn't know. And so I wanted to kind of fill in some of these gaps. So here is a phylogeny that I came up with. It turns out not to be a good phylogeny. I use plumage characteristics. A more recent phylogeny based on genetics uh, has, has changed this a lot, but the story still stays relatively the same. Um, using this phylogeny, I mapped on cooperative breeding. And it turns out that cooperative breeding, oops, um, it, not is not mapped on here, but let me just tell you that cooperative breeding evolved either way down here or right there, and that most of the lineages are cooperative. Now, when I first found this out, I was kind of bummed because I was like, going, "Well, I wanted to talk about the evolution of cooperative breeding, but it that you know down here for this group that could have been you know 26 million years ago. I'm not going to be able to find the original environmental context or social context for why that behavior evolved." So instead, I thought, well, maybe I can try to figure out why certain species have lost the behavior. And sure enough, that's what's being shown here. These lineages with the red dashes associated with them, these are lineages that have secondary, they came from an ancestor that had cooperative breeding, but they have lost the behavior. So in those cases, a reversal to non-cooperative breeding is there anything in common between these lineages ecologically? And sure enough, these are the lineages that are solitary nesters. Oops, sorry. So solitary nesters tend, not always, but they tend to lose cooperative breeding. So cooperative breeding appears to be closely linked to coloniality in most bee eater species, but when they do drop out of coloniality and become social, uh, at solitary nesting is less social, they also tend to lose cooperative breeding. And this was statistically significant uh, results. So lastly, uh, my research uh, led me to cooperate with David Ligon to write a, a review paper on uh, cooperative breeding and, and kind of how it could evolve. And we came up with two basic routes in which cooperative breeding could evolve. One is the idea that helping really starts off as this um, um, epiphenomenon of delayed dispersal. So you're, you have some ecological constraints to dispersal. You can't, you can't disperse anywhere. You stay at, at home in your natal territory with mom and bad, dad, but you hear these begging birds. So you turn into this robot, you start feeding the young. There may be benefits to philopatry for just survival and everything, but you, this epiphenomenon is the, talking about that you just start the helping behavior itself because you can't help yourself physiologically. If, however, that helping is adaptive, you end up uh, caring, uh, you, you know, gaining more experience by doing that behavior. You raise more um, closely related individuals so that you get uh, kin selection benefits. In that situation, kin selection is going to refine helping behavior to become more and more important part of that process 
because you are actually uh, getting fitness gains. And so it could lead to a more regular cooperative breeding system, not just some uh, uh, accident. And that's what's being shown here is you may, you know, this helper individual, when you're first born, you bounce around looking for open territories. You can't find any. There's no room at the end. All the territories are full. There's the extrinsic constraints. You stay at home. At first, you're helping mom and dad just because you hear these baby birds uh, calling. Um, but then you can see selection via kin selection to become more and more efficient as a helper, as a part of a system. Now, the second route to cooperative breeding is more what we, you would see in a situation of colonial species, where you start nesting. There's plenty of places to nest in, in a colony. Um, but if for, for some reason your nest fails because of predation or hatch failure, you're right there with a lot of birds that are begging. And so you may also have this epiphenomenon of you just start uh, uh, foraging, but there would be um, selection for individuals that choose to help close relatives. So in, in this situation, kin selection would also play a big role in um, um, developing that behavior. So in this case, extrinsic constraints may be less important, but kin selection and refining your behavior so that you're, you are helping at the closest relative possible, that's gonna uh, benefit your fitness. So let's, again, just graphically, let's say that you're attempting to breed here, um, your nest fails, so what are you gonna do? You go back to your natal nest and you help mom and dad raise your future uh, 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 brothers and sisters and you can gain some kin uh, benefits associated with that behavior. And maybe your mate goes to a different nest because if you're unrelated, when well, you should be if you're mated, they're going to their own uh, family unit. All right, so that is the lecture for today. Uh, I'll be working on uh, the next lecture, which is going to be talking about life history variation and how that influences different aspects of uh, birds' uh, fitness.